Hi everyone, um, welcome and thank you for joining us for the last session in our spring webinar series on dietary therapies for adults. Uh, we are pleased today to have Elisa uh, Nassbaum as our presenter. She is a uh, clinical dietitian and works at the pediatric specialty clinic at Yale New Haven Hospital as the ketogenic diet clinic coordinator. Uh, she works both with adults and uh, children though. You will have an opportunity at the end of the webinar to answer or to ask questions. Uh, please type those questions um, on your screen, uh, to, the, to the right of uh, your screen on the dashboard, under the questions section, and we will uh, answer those at the end. And uh, please uh, remember that you are all on listen-only mode and will, will not be able to uh, converse with us. Okay, so I guess I will now hand it over to Mrs. Nelson. Thank you. Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us. I really appreciate being here and I always like to reach out to people to talk about diet. Um, that's pretty much what dietitians enjoy doing the most, but I, as far as a dietitian job goes, I'm pretty sure that I have the best dietitian job because I get to actually treat a disease state with food. So in my line of work, the food is the medicine, it is the treatment, and it's really, really rewarding to have this particular position. So um, to get started, I am the clinic. I am a clinical dietitian, and I do work in at Yale at the Comprehensive Epilepsy Center, and I coordinate the Ketogenic Diet Clinic. The, right now, our clinic is much larger for children than for adults. But every single week, I get more and more calls from adults who are looking to use nutrition to help control their seizures. Um, so I've got to figure out how to navigate this. Thank you for being patient with me because I am new at technology. So I'm trying to figure out how to navigate through this. My um, The disclosure I have is that I am a, an employee at Yale New Haven Hospital. Our objectives today are we're going to learn about epilepsy, how diet can play a role, including the basics of the diet, and understanding mostly the different modifications that are available to the ketogenic diet. So at this point, I'm sure that most of you are familiar with the ketogenic diet. There was the movie starring Meryl Streep in 1997. Um, and Every year, there are more and more studies being published that show the benefits of this diet. So right now, the success with anti-epilepsy drugs, it's pretty good. About half the population becomes seizure-free with the first drug. Moving on from there, if you're not seizure-free from the first drug, from the second drug, you might become seizure-free. There are really sort of two different categories that seizure drugs, that anti-epilepsy drugs fall into. So if you are successful not in the first category, you might be successful in the second, or you might be successful with a combination of drugs. The problem is the, this group right here, the 36% that does not become seizure-free even with multiple anti-epileptic drugs. And though that's my patient population right there, the almost third of the people with seizures who are unable to successfully control their seizures with drugs. Um, the other part of my population that I treat are the people that are able to control their seizures with drugs, but they're having really unpleasant side effects. So oftentimes, the side effects from the medications are so disruptive to their lives that they choose not to use them and instead go on to the ketogenic diet. So at this point, the benefits of the ketogenic diet are well known. There have been a number of really positive studies showing that a great deal of people become seizure free. And every year I'm seeing more and more research on adults with epilepsy and how this same ketogenic diet that's so successful with children can also be used in adolescents and adults. 
It's becoming the standard number three treatment worldwide. So what that means is if you fail on one or two anti-epileptic anti drugs, the third course of treatment is often diet. So who gets put on the diet? So like we spoke about, it's patients who fail the traditional anti-convulsant therapies. Um, primarily right now it's pediatrics, although as I said, we are seeing more and more adults really all seizure types. Um, a lot of my patients might have things that are really going to be helped by a ketogenic diet, such as uh, GLUT1, people with GLUT1, but there are lots of other syndromes and um, epileptic diseases that people can use to be treated with the ketogenic diet. We ask people if they're going on the diet to try it, to give it at least a minimum of three months. The average time on the diet for children is two years. For adults, since they're on a more relaxed diet, version of the diet, it can be sort of a lifelong lifestyle way of living. There are some contraindications. Um, the absolute contraindications are carnitine deficiency, beta oxidation defects. These are all things um, that are genetic disorders that you would have been tested for and you would know that you have them. Now the relative contraindications are if you're losing too much weight and you're unable to maintain adequate nutrition on this restrictive diet, if your lab values are abnormal, I'm particularly thinking about lipid values or if there's non-compliance. So the basics, and forgive me if this is repetitive for some of you because I'm sure that many of you already know these sort of very basic nutrition information. Um, but everything we eat is made up of three macronutrients, carbohydrates, fat, and protein. So carbohydrates can be broken down into different types of carbohydrates, sugar, starch, and fiber. So your body usually wants to use carbohydrates for energy. It's the easiest, fastest, most effective thing for your body to use for energy. Um, and the simpler the carbohydrate, the faster your body uses it and the more quickly it's absorbed. Fat, fat is the most essential part of success on a modified ketogenic diet or a regular ketogenic diet. Now it has double the calories of carbohydrates and protein per gram, but a, you need a lot less of it. So much lower amount of fat helps you feel much fuller and gives you energy. And the important thing is choosing the right type of fat, which we'll talk about a little later. But basically you want to look for foods that are rich in mono and polyunsaturated fats and medium chain triglycerides. So olive oil, fatty fish like salmon, nuts, things like that are healthier sources of fat than really saturated fats like heavy creams or the fats that you would find in animal products. Um, the last category of macronutrient is protein. And protein is what helps your muscles prepare. So on either the ketogenic diet or one of the modified versions of the ketogenic diet, we really look for adequate protein. We look for high fat and adequate protein and low carbohydrate. The basics of the diet. The very basic level, we're looking at a high fat, low protein and carb combined. And because we want enough protein, the carbohydrate needs to be very low. So when you're looking at ratios, that very first number is going to be your fat. The second number of the ratio is your protein and carbohydrate combined. Now, a lot of kids, particularly ones who have very severe forms of seizure disorders, are on a three to one or four to one or even higher ratio. Adults are lower, something like one to one, maybe one and a half to one or two to one. The higher the ratio, the higher that number on the left side, um, that's, the lower the, that's the lower the amount of protein plus carbohydrate combined. So a four to one ratio is going to have much higher fat, much lower carbohydrate and protein. A one to one ratio is going to be a much more liberal diet. 
when we start kids on the diet, we often start them at three to one or higher. We start them as an inpatient. Those diets are precisely calculated and weighed on a gram scale. And as with medications, this diet is very, very specific to a patient's needs. And for the most severe forms of the diet, we're even looking at carbohydrates in medicines, lotions, sunscreens, lip balms, things like that. For adults, we use a much more liberal version of the diet, and that's what I'm really going to be focusing on today. So when people think of low carbohydrate diet, this is kind of what you think of. And this is basically what we're looking at for adults. We're looking at really good quality protein. Um, the carbohydrate source is always going to be either fruit or vegetables. You're not going to want to waste your carbohydrates on anything that is not nutrient dense. So you're going to want to stick with um, vegetables, fruits, things that are really have fiber in them and that are healthy sources of carbohydrates. Otherwise, um, we're looking at good sources of protein. Chicken, steak, fish is a great source of protein, and fats. Now, fats are also going to be in these particular sources of protein, and then we're going to have to add additional sources of fat. So things like cheese, maybe oil, butter, things like that. Nuts are a great source of protein and a great source of fat. So this is what the typical low carbohydrate looks like. Now, just for comparison, the very significant, severe form of the ketogenic diet that we put kids on, that's going to look a little differently. That's going to look something like this, which is a whole lot less appetizing. So you're looking at everything being weighed on a gram scale. Everything's measured. Everything is calculated to the very last gram specific to the patient's weight and disorder. Um, and as you can see, this is extremely restricted. But that's not the best for adults usually. For adults, we like the more liberal version of the diet. So this is sort of your modified ketogenic diet food pyramid. At the bottom, most of your food is going to come from fats and proteins and monounsaturated and saturated fats. You want proteins that also have fat in them. So things like fatty salmon, eggs are a good source of protein that also are rich in fats. So you want to sort of look at these combination foods that have both fat and protein in them. A little bit more limited are going to be animal fats and monounsaturated fats then as you can see, a very small, very low amount of carbohydrates. In fact, looking at these pictures, I don't think I would allow most of these carbohydrates on the diet because really, why would you waste your carbs on a croissant? Instead, I would encourage something like vegetables or fruit and water. Water is really an important part of this diet for a number of the side effects as well as satiety. So some side effects of the diet. And as you can see, I've marked the ones that are more common in adults and adolescents. Constipation is a, a pretty typical side effect of the diet. Um, less common are reflux and acidosis. Those are really things that we see more frequently in children. Kidney stones, there is the potential for kidney stones and that's why the water is so important. Having enough water will help keep your kidneys flushing things out and help keep sediment from building up. Um, with adults, one of the main things I worry about in adults is this one, high cholesterol and triglycerides. Depending upon the other medical issues that an adult on this diet may have, I really keep a close eye on lab values with cholesterol and triglycerides. Interestingly, when we have kids on the diet, we find that their cholesterol and triglycerides may regulate. So they might start off having high cholesterol and high lipids, but then everything kind of settles down and regulates. Adults are not so lucky. High cholesterol can be a little more dangerous and we wanna really keep those lipids in order. So I like to keep a close eye on those lab values. Um, in kids, we might see delayed growth. In adults, we would see weight loss and sometimes depleted energy. And that's mainly because of a little supplement that we like to give people called carnitine. 
Carnitine is something that your body naturally has stores of, and it's used to turn fat into energy. So normally your body has this in the fat that you intake in the course of a normal diet, there's enough carnitine in your body to store it into energy. When we switch to a high fat diet, your body may not have enough carnitine naturally, and you may need a carnitine supplement. That's also one of the lab values that we frequently test. So this is a really quick look at the mechanism of action um, of going into ketosis. And keep in mind that this is sort of a very top line look at it. And the actual metabolic mechanism of action isn't fully known or understood right now. But this gives you sort of a basic look at it. If you look, the diet is based off a ratio of the foods that we talked about. The fat is on this side, and the ratio of carbs and protein is on this side. And what that does is, although your body most easily goes to carbohydrate as a source of energy, when we limit the carbohydrate and we emphasize the fats, your body switches to a different source of energy, the ketones. And that's where we get the name ketogenic from. When your body switches to this form of energy, the seizure threshold, the things that might trigger a seizure, that's raised. So it can become more difficult for a seizure to be triggered when you're in ketosis. So there are a lot of different keto diet therapies, and this is a quick overview of all of them. The ones on the left, the ketogenic diet, um, is a 4 to 1 or 3 to 1 ratio. This is mostly what we use for children. We have an inpatient initiation. Um, it's very restrictive with calories. All of the food is weighted, measured on the gram scale. Now, we can also do a version of that that supplements with MCT oil, and that sort of relaxes or liberalizes the amounts of carbohydrates you can have. For adults, so we also have the modified Atkins where you're limiting your amounts of carbohydrates. So you might limit, as an adult, you might start off by limiting to 70 grams of carbohydrate a day and then pulling back to maybe 50 or 40 and trying to find the amount of carbohydrate that doesn't cause so many side effects but that positively affects your seizure disorder. Now, LGIT, that stands for Low Glycemic Index Therapy. The theory there is that if you are eating a food that is high in carbohydrate, you must mix it with a food that is high in fat so that the glycemic index is lowered. So glycemic index is how long it takes your body to turn a food, a carbohydrate, into sugar. So, for instance, a 100 on the glycemic index might be a piece of white bread or a croissant or a donut or a piece of candy, something that's a very simple sugar that is quickly turned into glucose for your body to use as energy. Now, on the opposite end of that would be a zero on the glycemic index, and that would be olive oil, for instance, because that has no carbohydrate in it whatsoever. So the idea is to balance these foods. So on the low glycemic index therapy, I ask people to stick with foods that are around a 50 or 60 on a glycemic index. So that might be a, a complex carbohydrate or a natural carbohydrate like a fruit or a vegetable. And then I ask them to mix that source of carb carbohydrate with a fat. So if you are having broccoli as your source of carbohydrate, you might want to saute it in olive oil or drizzle cheese on it. And that cheese or olive oil will pull down the glycemic index. Um, now my favorite form of the diet, and what most of my adults are on, is this combination of the diet. And when I say combination, I mean a combination of the modified Atkins diet and the low glycemic index therapy diet. So what that might look like is I ask people to, to try to aim for a number of carbohydrates per day. But at the same time, I ask them to mix those carbohydrates with a form of fat to lower the glycemic index. So we try to find a combination, and I find that that really gives adults 
a lot of leeway, say for instance you're at a restaurant or you're unable to plan your meals that day and you're stopping somewhere to get food. My, my goal is to really educate my patients enough so that they understand how to combine foods and how to limit carbohydrates and when they're faced with few choices, how to offset any carbohydrates they might be taking in. It's really, I always explain to patients that it's a very delicate balancing act and we're trying to balance the most liberal and healthiest diet possible with the least amount of side effects with the most seizure control that we can get. So that's sort of what we're aiming for every day. And that also might change with women who around their menstrual cycles, they might find that they might need to increase the fat and decrease the amount of carbohydrate. Um, if you are sleep deprived because you're either jet lagged from a trip or studying for an exam or, or having a long day of work, or if you um, are out and can't get enough sleep, then you might want to increase your fat and decrease the carbohydrate. So I really ask patients to sort of know and understand their own bodies and figure out what works for them, what their triggers might be, and when they might need to incorporate more of a low glycemic index diet or more, to, more of a modified Atkins diet. So at our keto clinic, we do not initiate the lower forms of the diet, the more relaxed forms of the diet as an inpatient. That's really saved for pediatrics who are in the most severe forms of the diet. I have my patients initiate the diet as an outpatient in three different um, in three different phases and we'll talk about those uh, in a minute but a couple of important things to remember that I ask all patients to do we need to switch their medications to the most mineral minimal amounts of carbohydrates available so some medications might be high in carbohydrates if you take a liquid vitamin that's sort of like a syrupy vitamin that might have carbohydrates in it, some of the anti-epileptic drugs that are solutions might be high in carbohydrates, so we might have to change those to a tablet or a sprinkle. Um, I also ask them to do surveillance labs every four to six months. And we're just looking at general profiles, sort of those typical things that we do when we do lab work. Um, but there are some special ones in here. I really check patients' lipids to make sure that all of their cholesterol numbers are in order and triglycerides are in order and where we want them to be. Um, I look at carnitine. I know we spoke about carnitine before. That's that compound that helps you turn fat into energy. So I want to make sure my patients have enough carnitine and don't need to be supplemented. BHB stands for beta-hydroxybutyrate, and that is the ketones in your blood. So we look to see what their ketone level at, levels are at in their blood. Um, we look at vitamin D, selenium, zinc, and magnesium. As needed, we might monitor some other things, but this is patient dependent. We might look at blood glucose. We might look at urine-specific gravity. If I if I think a patient is a little dehydrated, I do ask patients to check urine ketones at different times. Um, these are some other things that we might look at. So this is how we initiate the modified version of the diet. And remember, this is as an outpatient. Phase one is to eliminate the sources of simple sugars um, as much as possible. So things like bread, rice, candy, soda, baked goods, cupcakes, those kinds of very obvious sources of sugar. I like to have a patient do that for a few weeks just to sort of see if there's any difference that they feel either in terms of energy, um, in terms of seizures. Often we'll see an improvement in sleep when sugar gets eliminated. And it also makes the rest of initiating the diet a little less stressful and a little less challenging and it makes it more manageable and I find that doing it in this um, three to four phase initiation gives me a much better compliance for most of my patients. So after we've eliminated those simple sources of sugar, 
we move on to phase two, and that's where I ask a patient to restrict to a specific number of grams of carbohydrates. And depending on the patient, it could be anywhere from 70 down to 30, um, maybe 20 if they're a very small adolescent or a small adult. But it's really patient dependent, so I never like to, to sort of give out specific numbers on, um, on a presentation like this because it's really going to be different for everyone. Once they're used to that, I ask the patient to increase the fats. And that's why um, the things that we spoke about before, things like fatty fish, sources of protein like eggs, heavy cream if they can tolerate it, nuts and nut butters are a great way to add fats. So that's phase three. And then phase four, we assess and tweak as appropriate. Um, we might find that we are at a place where we can liberalize the diet more than we were. We might have great, great seizure control, um, but the patient is losing too much weight. So we liberalize the diet a little bit. Or on the other end of the spectrum, we might have good, but not great seizure control. So we might tighten up the diet a little bit. It really is variable and tailored to the specific patient. And by phase four, I've taken a look at some of their lab values, and that gives me a lot of information on to what direction I want them to go on the diet. So a little bit of the nitty gritty. This is how we look at a nutrition fact label on a food product and determine the number of carbohydrates. And this is where a lot of my patients get tripped up. Um, so basically, I. I prefer if patients use whole foods and cook for themselves and don't use any processed foods, so nothing that has a nutrition fact label. That's really unrealistic, though, and I know that people aren't going to do that, and I know that they're going to go to the grocery store and they're going to look at Atkins bars or one of those bars that say low carbohydrate all over it, and they're going to want to use those. So this is what I use to teach those patients. So we are, while we are going for as few carbohydrates as possible, carbohydrates are made up of a couple of things. So dietary fiber, you can subtract from the total number of carbohydrates. That's fine because fiber is not absorbed by your body. It goes straight through you and it does a lot of great things for your heart. So you want a lot of good fiber in your diet. So if you look at this food label, I think this was a cereal. Um, it's 27 grams of total carbohydrates minus four grams of dietary fiber. So that leaves you with 23 grams of carbohydrates, which in a half cup serving is quite a bit. Now, if you're looking at some of those low carb products, you're going to see another line here that is going to be sugar alcohols. So sugar alcohols, are not digested by the body as calories. So when it comes to something like weight loss, you don't necessarily have to count sugar alcohols as carbohydrates. However, some sugar alcohols, not all of them, but many of them can cross the blood-brain barrier, so they do negatively affect seizures. So unfortunately, things like those Atkins bars or other things that are labeled as low carb might help you with weight loss, but they might not help you with seizure control. So when you see those, do not subtract them because they very well might be absorbed. The other negative thing about sugar alcohols that I always explain to people is too many of them have some really unpleasant GI side effects. So gas, bloating, cramping, those foods that are often very high in sugar alcohols and are considered diet foods or low carb foods can be very, very uncomfortable to your GI tract. All right, so here's an important word about cholesterol control. As I said before, we, we do see a rise in lipid values when patients go on this diet, which makes sense because you're getting a whole lot more fat in your diet. So some of the things we try to do is focus on fats that are healthier than unhealthy fats. So what that means is first thing you want to eliminate all trans fats. Those are the things that are chemically added to foods to make them stable. 
So those we want to take out as much as possible. And like I said before, if you're sticking with foods that are whole foods, you're not going to have trans fats. Trans fats are added to foods that are processed. So it's easy to take them out of your diet. You want to limit the saturated fats and focus on the monosaturated fats and the polyunsaturated fats, particularly those that are high in omega-3 fatty acids. Um, I have some good sources listed here. Fatty fish, chia seeds are wonderful. Flax seeds are wonderful. Nuts are wonderful. Um, different types of oil are good, particularly uh, olive oils um, and other plant-based oils. So here's a sample meal plan, right? What, is this, what does this look like? This is typically what it would look like. For breakfast, you would do scrambled eggs, maybe with some heavy cream and cheese on it, sort of an omelet. Uh, sausage is fine. And then coffee with heavy cream. You could use a, a sweetener in there, too, if you wanted to, like Splenda. Uh, lunch might be turkey and cheese pinwheels. So typically what you would put on a turkey and cheese sandwich, just with no bread. I would just have the patient roll them up together. Uh, and a small salad with an oil and vinegar dressing. A lot of those store-bought commercial dressings are going to be really high in carbohydrates because they have added sugars. Dinner might be seared salmon with avocado and tomato. And on that seared salmon, you might just want to put some fresh herbs or salt and pepper. A lot of the herb blends or the rubs or the sauces are going to have a lot of sugar in them. So you're going to want to avoid those. Um, and a cream soup, sort of a cream of broccoli soup, something that you make yourself with heavy cream where you know it has the most basic and healthy ingredients. Snacks might be a full fat yogurt, plain, plain full fat yogurt, not flavored, with some chopped fruit in it. Uh, there are keto shakes available, either homemade with uh, heavy cream or some kind of commercial product. There are some great recipes out there that use avocado as their base, and those are, um, they actually don't sound as delicious as they are, and they are, they are pretty good though. Um, here are some resources that you can go to for more information, and one of the reasons that I really wanted to include these resources is that I frequently get phone calls and emails from patients who have gone to um, other sources for information on ketogenic diet and modified versions of the ketogenic diet, and they're being given very bad information, and I'm always very concerned about where my patients are getting their information from. Um, a couple of red flags to look for to know whether you're getting good keto information or bad keto information. You want it to come from a verified source, so um, hospital or Epilepsy Foundation or the Charlie Foundation is a nonprofit. Um, another red flag to look for if you are going to some kind of alternative or complementary treatment doctor, which can have a lot of benefits, um, but if they are trying to put you on a ketogenic diet and they haven't taken your lab values, that's a concern. If they haven't taken into account the carbohydrates in the medicines that you're on, that's a big concern. Um, the biggest concern I see from, the biggest red flag I see from patients who have gotten ketogenic diet information from alternative sources um, is if they are trying to sell you their own supplements. If they are leading you towards um, supplements or keto shakes or something where the profits go right in their pocket, I would be really concerned about the information that they're giving you. Um, and surveillance. How are, they, how are they looking out for you? How are they having you track your seizures? How are they having you, how often are you going in for blood tests? Um, how are they checking to make sure your kidneys are healthy? So all of those things are red flags that you really want to look for, and I would really encourage you to get your ketogenic diet information or your modified ketogenic diet information from a really valuable medical source. These are my references, um, and now I'm happy to take any questions if anyone has any. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I guess I'll start, Alisa, if that's okay. I have a few questions. Um, so is this something that um, people can't just, like, look at this webinar and try and do on their own? You wouldn't suggest that, correct? Well, you know, it, it's, first of all, it, it's kind of dangerous because if you have some sort of underlying metabolic disorder or if your um, lab values aren't in order or if you're prone to some to kidney stones, it's really best to at least have one or two visits with um, a registered dietitian and an epileptologist, at the very least let your epileptologist know what you're doing to make sure none of the medications you're on are contraindicated. Some of the medications, um, the ketogenic diet might inhibit absorption of those meds. So it, it really is not something that I would encourage people to do without proper supervision from a dietitian and an epileptologist. The, um, the other issue is I find when people sort of just look at information and or look at information online from non-reputable sources and do it on their own, they're trying to make these very drastic and challenging changes and they're really not doing it correctly. So it often becomes a little bit of wasted effort and mm -hmm. wasted time because they're not really doing it properly. Yeah. Um, it looks like there's a question here, but I, let's see. Okay, here's my question. As a school nurse, is there anything we should watch for when a student comes back to school newly on the diet? Okay, that's a great question because I do have a lot of kids on the diet and they go back to school. I usually send them with a letter specifically for the schools or the caregivers. Um, so the things I would look for for kids are the more visible signs of hypoglycemia. So if they're shaking or if they seem to get sweaty or clammy, that might be a sign of hypoglycemia, particularly if a kid's nonverbal, then you might want to look for that. Um, weight loss is another thing I would look for that, that um, teachers and school nurses can really help with to make sure that a child isn't losing weight too rapidly and getting enough fluids. That's a really, really important part of the diet is that kids are, if kids are getting enough water. So I would really ask that any school nurse help by um, really pushing water on these kids to make sure they're not dehydrated. I hope that answers your question. Oh, here's another one, let's see. Uh, are there any ready-made products that students that are NPO can use via G-tube if homemade formula is spilled or forgotten? Yeah, there, there, are, um, <clears throat> there are a couple of formulas that come in those Tetra packs that sort of look like juice boxes. Keto-V is one of them, and Keto-Cow also makes a ready-to-drink formula. Um, and I always ask parents, regardless of what version of the diet their children are on. I often ask parents to go out and get um, maybe a dozen of those Tetra packs to keep in their basement or to send in to school in case of emergency because they don't need to be refrigerated until they're open and they're stable for about a year. So that way if there's a school lockdown or if there's a hurricane and the school loses power or the moms at home and school loses and they lose power at their home, there's always something for a kid to eat. So I would I would definitely have any parent with a kid on this diet send in a couple of those ready to drink versions of formula, either from Keto V, they make a chocolate and vanilla version, or Keto Cow, who makes a vanilla version. They're not great. Um, they're better if they're very cold than not cold, but it's a, it's a good substitute. Any uh, any other questions for me? I do have one more, um, Elisa. Uh, so as far as the referral process, um, 
do you just sit with people for consultations initially, or um, in, the, in order to make an appointment with you, would they need to be referred by the neurologist? Um, I ask that patients, I'm sorry, Doctor, one of my uh, epileptologists, Dr. Matson, just came in because I'm using his office. Um, but no, the best way to do it is to make an appointment with your epileptologist, and, um, and then they would refer the patient to the dietitian. That's usually how it works. But is that typically only if they think that it's a good idea or appropriate for that particular patient? Well, when we're talking about adults, um, any adult that is going to bring it up with the doctor, the doctor is going to send them to me because I can always find a version of the diet that would be appropriate for the adult. It might be a more liberal version, um, but there's always going to be some tweak of diet that might help with seizure control. Mm -hmm. And if not seizure control, it might help with alertness. A lot of times it's kind of interesting we might not see the number of seizures go down, but we might see the length of seizures be shortened, or we might have a patient who gets auras before seizures continue to get auras but not have them develop into seizures, or we might see the post-ictal state after a seizure shorten a great deal. So it's not always the number of seizures, but there might be other things surrounding the seizure disorder where we see a benefit from the diet. Um, Additionally, a lot of patients see improved sleep and improved energy. Mm. Wow. That, that's fabulous and, and very encouraging, I think, and you know, that we can encourage our adults. So if you are interested in learning more about your diet and, and perhaps um, adapting something like this to talk to your neurologist and, and even just go for, um, as Elisa uh, mentioned, one or two appointments um, and talk with a dietitian to see about the, um, the potential, you know, for something like this. So I think that's really exciting um, therapy like this. So um, if, if there are no other questions, um, I guess we will we'll go ahead and close. And um, just a reminder that um, probably by tomorrow, anybody can go on our website, which is epilepsyct.com. And they can um, they can register to listen to this webinar at any time. So you can send family or friends or others that you might know that might be interested to our website. Um, and then we will be starting up our uh, webinar series again in the fall. So September we'll we'll have a whole new um, series of webinars. So thank you all for joining us, and thank you, Elisa, uh, for being here with us today. Thanks so much for having me. This was fun. Thanks. Thank you.